This is Twit. You're talking to a spacecraft that's uh, 15 plus billion miles away that is running some chips, some custom fabricated chips built by Texas Instruments that were baselined. I mean, the original chip design was based like 1964 when, I mean, integrated circuits were, were barely even a thing then. And, um, you know, to be able to continue talking to these these things and using this very low bandwidth data recorder that's a tape drive, it's running tape back and forth over the same heads for 50 years. I mean, I guess the things that blow my mind are, A, they're still working in this radiation-saturated environment, at least it, it was when they were out, you know, doing the flybys. Uh, B, you, you've got magnetic tape that's running back and forth all these years. It's still working. I don't have any magnetic tape that still works. And C, just, you know, knowing how to program for and talk to these things that are so elderly. I mean, this must be a really difficult management problem for you planning your campaigns. Well, the, the other thing that's important is that the Voyager computers are small, very small compared to what we think of as computers today. In fact, uh, the memory in your key fob is more than what's in the Voyager memory. And That's so that means, wait, wait, yeah. you said key fob. So the thing that beeps the car open, right? Opens your, <laughs> your car. Yeah. Yeah. Then, yeah. And so you think about your, your cell phone, how much more capable with its camera, how much more capable that that is. And so the programmers had to be very clever. And so they had to write subroutines that got called by multiple other routines on board the spacecraft. And so when Voyager one went through its anomaly, uh, that was quite a challenge because there's actually a, a chip, 256 words that were, da- you know, that was basically stuck, stuck bit. And so we had to take all of the subroutines in that portion and move them to another place in the, in the memory that was good. And then relink all those subroutines and get everything that called them, uh, to work properly again. And so that, that was a challenge. But first, just finding out what was wrong with the spacecraft. Here, one day we have good science data, good engineering data coming back. The next day, all of a sudden, we just hear essentially a tone. It was sort of a repeating series of zeros and ones, but no information coming back. And so that's what you started with to try and fix Voyager 1. So you try some of the more obvious techniques. You start turning hardware on and off to see if something might reboot in a sense and and come back. And or and then you get uh, you notice that doesn't seem to help too much. And then you start poking a little bit, sending little commands into the hardware to see if you get a response and slowly bit by bit worked our way up to getting a memory readout of the flight data subsystem. And in that memory readout, that's where we saw that one of the chips had failed. And then the the, what I call the rescue mission began to (laughs) sort of reprogram and uh, send that code up and Voyager doesn't have any physical hardware test beds off on a mission. You can run your software, whatever you're going to do, through hardware on the ground that's very similar to what's in space. And Cassini made good use of that. Or sometimes it's software. You have software testing that you can do on it. But in the case of Voyager, the test beds are long gone. We don't have any software that we can use to run it through. So it was sort of an eyes only. I think three different people looked through the bits of code that they had written to put in another place of the memory to make sure it was correct. And, and then we sent it up. So that that was going to be my question. I mean, you know, the, the amount of sweat that would be coming off my palms, if I had to be the guy that pushed that button, because I'm old enough to remember when Voyager, uh, sorry, Viking one shut down because of an erroneous bit of programming that was checked before it went up, but we lost contact with it. So you're saying that there is not a physical 50 year old test bed on the ground that you can run these things through first. The the test beds are long since broken. And there was always the feeling that that Voyager is only going to last another couple of years, another couple of years. And so the question was, do you invest the time and the effort to, to keep your test beds up and running? And so they thought, no, you know, it's okay. (laughs) We we, we can, we can do without, you know, the test beds. And so it's, it's, it's really a tribute to these very bright 
engineers. I remember going in and they had all of the circuit diagrams up on the wall and mm -hmm. sticky notes all over the place. And, and, and one of them said, this is just so fascinating. I've never done anything like this before. And he had to kind of trace and figure out uh, what was going on. That was in the early days before we knew exactly what was wrong with uh, Voyager. And you're right, the, the people that wrote that code, we all gathered uh, on a Saturday early in the morning uh, to wait for it, it. The other thing for Voyager 1 is it takes 22 and a half hours at the speed of light for a signal to go up to Voyager 1. And then we have to wait another 22 and a half hours, you know, almost a light day each direction to get the information back. So here we are seated together watching for that signal to come back. Uh, I brought in some Lucky Peanuts, uh, I think Lucky <laughs> Peanuts that can, can always help. So we were passing around Lucky Peanuts and munching and just watching, you know, as the minutes tick down for when everything should come back to life on Voyager, you know, if this code worked correctly. You could have heard a pin drop in the room. It was very uh, silent. Everybody's looking at the screen, waiting and watching. Everybody, the, the people were, that had certain subsystems they were responsible for had their screens all ready to see if the data would load and what it would look like. We needed sort of a health check on Voyager 1 because it had been five months since we'd had any information. And that minute hit, and all of a sudden it started to populate the data. And it looked, you know, the program was working as planned. All of those changes had, were working. And so those programmers, they just jumped up and they cheered. <laughs> and they were the happiest people in the room, I think. And yeah. there was just a sense of, of, you know, joy that we had Voyager 1 back and relief. You know, it had been a long wait to see just what was happening again on Voyager 1. That is fascinating. She just said that Voyagers themselves have outlasted their, like, ground backups. <laughs> That's how that's how well they were built and how nerve wracking it must be to be one of those those code reviewers. There's just three people on the ground to double. check. Right. At least three. I mean, the yeah. three key people responsible for just line by line going through. And it wasn't a lot of code. There aren't that many words in the Voyager memory. So it wasn't a lot of code they had to replace and uh, looking at it carefully and, and making sure that it would work. And and it did. It did. The, the key thing, though, right now we're just getting back engineering data, which is important to make sure that, you know, the attitude control system looks like it's doing well, the uh, command and control subsystem, that they're all doing well, the power looks okay. So the spacecraft is basically healthy like it was in November. Uh, the next step over the next few weeks is to now send up a little bit more code that will give us the science data modes to send the science back. Mm -hmm. And so I'm really looking forward to that. There's a a feature we were watching just before the anomaly. It's called nicknamed Pressure Front 2. And it'd be very interesting to see if it's there. We first saw it in the 2020s. It was a, a jump in the magnetic field and the plasma. And it continued over those, you know, three plus years. And it's so different from anything we've seen. Usually most events, shocks from the sun go up and then over the next few weeks or months go back down. So Pressure Front 2 is hanging in there. Is it a solar effect? Is it something coming from interstellar space or a combination of the two? So it'd be really good to see if it's still there and see what it's doing. Oh man. So this, this, this glitch came up and you were stuck on a cliffhanger of science. That, that's <laughs> right. That's right. Well, we've been watching it for like a little over three years. So, but we'd really like to see if it's still there and, and it doesn't represent a, a boundary or something different, something okay. different about interstellar space. So, so just, I guess really quickly, just for the timeline there, because I think we're going to go to a, a, a quick break after, but you, you mentioned this happened in November, this, this switch to just the tone and then, and then the investigation to try to solve it all. And is the five months there uh, that it took to, to get there solely because of how difficult a trick it was, or is it really because of that light delay? You have, you can only do one thing and then you have to wait. And when you wait, What's everyone doing for that 22 hours? I mean, I, I, I think I would be like on pins and needles the whole time, but I, it sounds like you have to, you know, move on and just wait for the answer uh, and be patient, it seems. We tended to command about once a week. And so you'd have that two days from when the command went up till you, till you saw what had happened. And in the meantime, you were thinking ahead about what else you might try if it didn't work. And so in the beginning, we were careful and cautious about what we tried. And then as the, the series of things, we sort of had a decision tree. As you go down the paths of the tree, you just have to try more and more aggressive types of of poking at the computer. Or, you know, look, you're looking through old memos to get information. It's like, 
an archaeological dig? Can we find a memo with an anomaly that was like this? Turned out in the 1980s, something very similar happened to the flight data subsystem. A, a chip failed, a hardware failure. And they had written a little piece of code all the way back in the 80s. So we had that piece of code, but we didn't have the nice documented version of the code. We basically had kind of the the machine language code that we had to sort of translate back, you know, back into human understandable code and use that as a starting point. So that, but it was very useful to have that code that was written actually back in, in 1980 for Voyager 1 for a similar, a similar kind of anomaly. So for some reason, my brain's still st stuck on the idea of being that person that was working out this new bit of code to send up and put the, 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 the comma in the wrong spot or something. <laughs> the next thing you know, it's like, um, we didn't hear anything after hour 23. Like, oh my God. All right. We will be right back after the short break. Our last one, stay with us. So at this point, uh, have you figured out, it sounds like you did exactly what happened up there. Was it a cosmic ray data hit or something or an actual chip failure? You think? Uh, it could have been a cosmic ray hit that caused the chip failure, or it could just be old hardware. Mm. Uh, we don't know what exactly caused it, but clearly it's a piece of hardware that has failed. Uh, sometimes with a cosmic ray hit, we might flip a bit and then we can go back in and, you know, put the right words into that, that memory location, the right values, and we're okay. But this was much bigger. It took out a lot of 256 words. But is, is, if I understand correctly, part of what makes this older hardware more radiation tolerant is just simply that it's larger and that it, it was able to withstand more of that, the impact on those heavy ions than something modern would. Is that right? That's a factor. You're right. All the components themselves are larger. I, just really quick, I mean, does, would that mean, uh, you know, if we have all these new fancy chips and, 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 and boards that, that, you know, for, for the spacecraft that, that are being launched today, would they be as resilient in 46 years? as the Voyagers have been, or are they more susceptible because they're more complicated and more, I guess, dense with the, the chips and stuff that are, that are on them? Uh, yeah, those, those tiny chips are certainly more complicated, um, but along the way, I think we've learned a lot about how much shielding we need and what's the best kind of shielding. And for instance, uh, Europa Clipper has a lot of their, uh, you know, there are a lot of components in what they call the vault which is very heavily shielded mm -hmm. because their orbits take them in to fly by Europa. They have to get close to Jupiter. So I think we've learned a lot about how to shield along the way and how thick and how much mass that shielding has to you know, represent to do that kind of a job. Hey, if you enjoyed this clip, be sure to check out This Week in Space. You can find us on your favorite podcast app or see the link in the description below. See you there. <laughs>